What's up, queens? Welcome to the Female Dating Strategy Podcast, the meanest female-only podcast on the internet. I'm Ro. And I'm Savannah. All right, here's our long-awaited episode about feminist sex, more than likely a multi-part episode. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex, baby. (laughs) And this was in response to, well, a few things, but primarily the depictions and discussion of what feminist sex is that's coming from what we would call lib fem media. Even the term, even the term just makes me cringe, like feminist. It gives me like the same reaction when it's like when they say like feminist porn. It's like, yeah, because it's so misguided and fluffy. And I feel like they don't want to say the thing. They don't want to define the real problem. So if you are subscribed to our Patreon, we did an episode that we just released on Friday about an article that was posted in Vogue that was trying to define what feminist sex was. And uh, to recap, here's a couple of their answers. The first one being, uh, feminist sex is about having a sex life that is free of expectations. That was definition number one. Definition number two was feminist sex is about having the sex you want to be having rather than the sex you think you should be having and getting maximum pleasure. And then definition number three was feminist sex is essentially good sex. Learning how to ask really good questions and listening to the answer you receive is key. (laughs) I'm here to tell the audience today why all of that is horseshit. Now, (laughs) it's house shit. House shit. (laughs) Allow me to tell the entire audience today why all of that is collectively horseshit and they are not focusing on the actual problem. Okay. So one of the things that they don't address in here is the male half of the equation about why we're not having good sex, because that is the entire reason why we're not having good sex. And I don't understand how we can talk about feminist sex and not talk about the inherently unequal power dynamics between men and women currently and historically that have contributed to us not having the sex that we want. It's like they do everything but name the actual problem. Name the problem. Like if you read the article itself, like they direct a lot of advice in quotation marks towards women. And then there's like two sentences towards men, even though they are the problem. So I have an idea that they perhaps they know they just don't want to say you know what the problem is in order not to alienate their audience or whatever or piss off men or i don't know but it's just mind-boggling that all this advice that they'll talk around the problem they'll direct the solution towards women but men will maybe get a sentence or two like max any article that talks about feminist sex that doesn't mention men is completely missing it's garbage, right? It's like, we're not having good and feminist sex because men don't want us to have it. And that is the only reason. They don't want us to have it. That's it. <laughs> and again, men will admit this as well. Like, they all admit that they're selfish in bed or that they're not really invested in getting the woman off or they think it's too much work. Men will say this with their own mouths and women still won't pull them up on it. Right. So if you're not focusing on men... You're not focused on the problem because the only thing stopping us from having good sex is one, the lack of education about our bodies, understanding how our bodies work. And once again, men don't want us to have that. And also men's failure to comply to our sexual desires because they don't want to. So I feel like when we're talking about this, if you don't address those two huge factors and why women aren't having better sex, and it's pretty much primarily straight women, by the way, almost entirely a problem for straight women, not really a problem for other variations of same-sex couples or straight men. So it's clearly not just about in any way, just about like these specific acts in the bedroom. And there seems to be this over-focus on whether certain acts are feminist or not within the bedroom. But I'm like, overall, what determines whether or not we're having feminist sex starts far, far, far before we ever get into the bedroom. And if we don't talk about that aspect of it, then we're not actually talking about feminist sex. You're just talking about like specific sex acts and then like the inherent dynamics behind it. So I would like to posit an FDS definition of feminist sex. What is feminist sex? So let me put forth the FDS definition of feminist sex. So this is what we came up with. And you heard it here first, ladies. You heard it here first. The ability for women to express and exert compliance to their sexual desires from men and in the culture, and the ability for women to make informed, healthy decisions about their body free from male social, economic, legal, and political influence. That's our definition of feminist sex. So are you able to exert compliance to your sexual desires from men? 
Are you able to express them freely? Does our culture support women expressing them freely? Does our culture support women having enough education about their body and their sexuality in order to understand and express their desires outside of men's influence, right? Like you have to almost think of it like there's two polarities here. There's men and the sexual desires that they want. And then there's women and the sexual desires that they want. And there's some overlap and there's some spectrum, but there a lot of it can be actually competing interests, right? And I feel like everyone wants to tiptoe around the fact that there are competing sexual interests between men and women because people don't like to, at least this lib femme shit, they don't like to talk about that aspect of it. It's like, I get annoyed because I feel like they don't really want power, right? They don't really want to fix it. Yeah. And it's also the fact that they would have to then acknowledge that the men they are seeking to engage with are not looking to engage with them on the same level. Like this whole idea of equality between the sexes is nonsense, as I've always said, because men aren't interested in being equal with women. This is why equity is a better goal for women. They're just not interested. And so when we talk about sex, it's like men aren't actually interested in making like sex equal, in quotation marks, women. They don't care about it. And this is where the lib fair media is so misguided. And this is why a lot of women who follow the so-called, if a man can shag around, I can do it too. If a man can do this, they end up very, very disappointed because they are almost being led into a game or a trap where there's no way of them winning. Right. Because they have no ability to exert sexual compliance for men. Right. That's why so many women that end up having a lot of sex are never having a lot of good sex because there's one lack of education about their bodies. They don't necessarily know how their bodies work in the first place. So they're just out there guessing with a lot of different sexual partners. And then also when they're having these sexual encounters, they're often not able to get men to comply to the things they actually want. Right. And it could be because they just don't have the equipment, meaning they dick too little or (laughs) (laughs) eeny, meeny, teeny little short dick man. You are going to hell, but so am I. (laughs) I mean, but facts, right? Or the guy just doesn't have the patience, equipment and skill, or he doesn't care about them enough to do it. Yeah. He doesn't care. That's a huge part of it. That's the main thing. They just don't care. They think sex exists to service them primarily and they operate like that. And any encounter you have with men starts with that more than likely, unless they're a particularly aware and skilled and mature sexual person. For the most part, men go into sexual encounters with a high degree of selfishness because they haven't been taught not to or there's no consequences for them not doing it or very little consequences. And a lot of men's eyes, if they have sex, whether or not it was good for you or not, they don't particularly care. It doesn't cost them anything to give you bad sex, right? And the informal gossip network, which I think is a great thing for women to try to exert power, like if a guy's really bad in bed and that gets around, but like Often that never really gets around. So a lot of men just feel like I had sex or they'll just call the girl a whore and then like she gets slut shamed so then they don't care. Yeah, this is the thing. It ends up backfiring on the woman because again, equality, like it's, it ends up looking bad on the woman if it gets out that she had a, a sexual encounter with a man, especially a casual one, more so than the man. Right. So once again, if we're not talking about these factors and we're talking about why we aren't having good sex or what feminist sex is, then you're just wasting your time. Everything after that is just like feel good fluff about like, we always want women to have sexual pleasure and the joy of sex. I'm like, yes, all of us want that. We are all in agreement there. The question is, why aren't we having it? And no one wants to talk about the problem. <laughs> yeah. You can't really talk about the liberation of the oppressed class without talking about the role of the oppressor. It would just be like talking about liberating the slaves without talking about the role of the slave masters. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So the purposes of discussion for the rest of this episode, FDS is going to focus on the two points that we bring up about women's ability to exert our influence on men as far as sexual compliance and the ability for women to make informed, healthy decisions about their bodies free from male social, economic, legal, and political influence, because we look at it like a strategy, right? So I feel like liberal feminism, they have so much focus on what it should be ideologically and not on a tangible granular level. So our focus on feminist sex for this episode and the episodes uh, to come about feminist sex are going to be about strategy to exert sexual compliance from men to your sexual desires, to discover your sexual desires, to get education about your body, and then how to exert sexual compliance for men. Because if you don't have that, then you're not going to be able to have good sex. You can't figure that out. Yeah. So, 
and also assessing your risks and rewards with sex with men. So, okay. So first point, first, we're going to talk about the biological aspects of feminist sex. The first point is the ability and resources to understand the biological mechanisms of our bodies. So AKA sex education. This is a huge controversy, especially for us who grew up prior to the internet age, or at least like had most of our childhood without the internet. All of your sex education used to come from your parents and or from your health class at school or through the informal network of uh, child bullshit, (laughs) of child lies and uh, fairy tales that you would make up and tell stories to each other because you didn't know any better. It was so bad as well. Like I remember sex ed was basically, at least when I was growing up in the UK, it would be like women uh, menstruate and boys have wet dreams. That was pretty much it. In the States, we had something called abstinence-only education. What? Okay. That was Bush era. Yeah, Bush era. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's a push towards schools. And let me actually Google this real quick because I want to make sure I'm talking about. Uh, Was it baby Bush era or HW Bush? Baby Bush era. It was baby Bush. Oh, God. That's quite recent. Damn. Yeah, I know. No, this is not ancient history. This is from when I was a kid, right? (laughs) Abstinence only education. I mean, I got that in the church, but I didn't know that was an actual, like, an approved curriculum in the US. Yeah. So during the Bush era, the government would only fund these abstinence only programs. So basically, if you wanted money from the federal government for your school, the... Oh my God. Let me actually read the actual. So in the US, states could apply for federal funding of abstinence only sex educations, sex education programs from either Title V, the Adolescent Family Life AFLA, or the Community Based Abstinence Education CVAE. To be eligible for funding, programs must satisfy requirements given under the Social Security Act, which is reproduced here verbatim. So this is actually a federally funded initiative to push abstinence only education. So for the purposes of this section, the term abstinence education means an educational or motivational program, which has its exclusive purpose teaching the social, psychological, and health gains to be realized by abstaining from sexual activity, teaches abstinence from sexual activity outside marriage as the expected standard for all school-aged children, teaches that abstinence from sexual activity is the only certain way to avoid out-of-wedlock pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, and other associated health problems, teaches that a mutually faithful monogamous relationship in the context of marriage is the expected standard of human sexual activity, teaches that the sexual activity outside the context of marriage is likely to have harmful psychological and physical effects, Uh, teaches that bearing children out of wedlock is likely to have harmful consequences for the child, the child's parents, and society, teaches young people how to reject sexual advances and how alcohol and drug use increases vulnerability to sexual advances. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is bad. H teaches the importance of attaining self-sufficiency before engaging in sexual activity. So these are the bullet points that were part of the federal requirements in the United States in order for you to get funding under Title V, for states to get funding for their sex program under Title V. So the funding, which began in the 1980s, I guess it did actually begin under uh, George Bush Sr. So the funding, which began under the 1980s, has continued to increase since its inception. For example, the George W. Bush administration increased federal funding for abstinence-only programs the only type funded even under the previous Clinton administration, while the Obama administration reversed the emphasis and provided more federal dollars for comprehensive sex education. President Trump cut grants to comprehensive sex education and proposed increased funding for abstinence-only sex education. So it wasn't reversed. So this abstinence-only education, as it pertains to getting federal funding, was not reversed until Obama. And then it was nullified by President Trump. Oh my gosh. I'm not surprised semi-surprising but that's wild i thought that was only a church thing because i got that when i went to sunday school and pretty much the church is like abstinence only no i mean most schools what they did is they would give you like the basic biological mechanisms of how your body works and then also do abstinence education as part of the curriculum because they wanted federal funding but like they basically have like it both concurrently but like the only type of uh social dynamics they were really allowed to talk about if they wanted this federal funding was abstinence only. So once again, why do they want to push this abstinence only? And it's always been about controlling female sexuality. And because we've had birth control since the 60s now. So it's not about like preventing out of wedlock pregnancies so much as it's about coercively 
pressuring women to uh, see themselves as sexual beings for the existence of male pleasure. And in this case, their quote, future husband's pleasure, right? And the problem with this is that like, I mean, besides the obvious, like the problem with this is that the lack of focus and comprehensive aspect of sex education is more hurtful to women than to men and specifically girls and boys, because women's reproductive system, as well as our sexuality, is extremely complex compared to men, right? Just physically, biologically, men's sexuality is essentially point and shoot, whereas like all of our organs are internal, except for like our vulva and our clitoris. So then like, it's not intuitive how everything works, right? (laughs) Like in the same way with men. Yeah. Isn't it like only recently that they realized that the clit is actually like much bigger than they thought it was. It's like a whole internal system. Yeah, exactly. Like it's a whole, an internal uh, nerve network to your clitoris, right? So science hasn't even really been seriously studying it for all that long, but Again, that only serves the male imperative, which is basically to keep women ignorant so that we are forced into some kind of sexual compliance to them. So this, once again, only hurts women because the lack of ability for us to get educated and have the resources to educate our bodies like means that we don't have the ability to make informed decisions about our bodies, about how things work in order to know how to have the sex that we want, even if we want to have it, and even if we do have a compliant partner. So this is where I feel like Uh, feminist sex education really needs to focus on. And I mean, focus on it on like a real clinical educational way and not this like uh, crazy lip fem shit where it's all about like, I like to get choked out and punched in the face during sex. Like, no, I mean, understanding like our legitimate biological mechanisms for arousal, like, you know, whatever, dopamine, serotonin, understanding, uh, yeah, the actual physical mechanics of how our hormones affect our sexual cycles. Yes. This is something actually, the one you touched on, this is why I think birth control massively fails women. Cause I remember when I was prescribed birth control and several of my friends, we were saying like, I don't feel any desire at all, but we were told, no, it's not because of the pill. It's not because of that. Then the minute I came off them, it came back and it's literally like clockwork when I'm horny and when I'm not like, and that like so many women aren't told that when they are prescribed with contraception that it massively fucks with your cycle and with your desire and your hormone levels and so they think that the problem the reason why they're not interested in sex in quotation marks is because of them when it's not right exactly so that's another example so the medical industry has a vested interest in downplaying women's concerns about how our sexuality works because obviously the pill is an extremely extremely profitable type of medication so Understanding that there are conflicting forces and conspiring forces to keep women ignorant about how our sexuality works and to be dismissive of it in order to focus on men's sexuality and to ensure our compliance in accordance to men's sexuality. Because it's not necessarily a problem for men that we're not enjoying the sex because of our birth control, right? Because our birth control makes us feel hormonal or bloated, et cetera, or lacks our sexual desire you know, outside of just medication, like even things like uh, the position of your cervix, like one thing I didn't know for a long time. And now that I read it, it makes sense about like how, where your cervix can be, can sit in different spots during different parts of your ovulation cycle. And so sex feels different, right? So there's just like little things like that are important for us to understand physiologically, as well as understanding the interaction of medications in the medical industry and the different types they try to do And also not even just the medical industry, but like the sex toy industry, them trying to uh, offer us solutions that don't necessarily benefit us, but help them sell a product. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like the next generation of feminists really needs to be focused on truly understanding women's sexual mechanisms from like a biological granular level. Like we should have a lot more research on this by now, (laughs) but we don't because of Lack of funding, lack of interest. Well, we know why, right? The lack of interest, yeah. In science, like majority of the funding is obtained by male researchers. Right. And since we have federal initiatives not promoting it and promoting things like abstinence only education, then there's no financial incentive that they can draw a line to to create these products. So I'm hoping as we get more female scientists, biologists, doctors, anthropologists, that these women who are educated enough can start to put forth more female-centric hypotheses, research narratives based on their experience of treating female patients and studying women so that we're not just out here in the dark and the way that we've been for so long. 
um, about how things work, right? Obviously, we know more than our ancestors did, but just understand that like in the absence of knowledge about how women's bodies work, the culture always tends to blame us. You know, before we understood about DNA and gametes and how sex is determined by the sperm, if you couldn't produce a son, the woman was blamed, right? Even though we know now that whether or not a woman has a son is determined by the man's, whether or not a baby is a boy is determined by the man's sperm. But in the absence of that kind of knowledge, it was just thought that some women couldn't produce sons. So I feel like having the ability to really like force uh, the education and science into a place of a female centric narrative only serves to benefit us so that men aren't allowed to exert a lot of ignorant assumptions in the absence of information. Yes, exactly. So with that, so number two is understanding our mind-body connection when it comes to sex. So are we having sex because it's pleasurable to us, we want to have sex, or are we having sex or the sex we want to have a result of trauma or mental illness? So this is a bit controversial because this comes down to the discussions we've had over and over again about a lot of the people that get into BDSM or why BDSM is pushed. And they've even had people advocate for things like BDSM therapy. They do have that. They actually have that as well. Like if they like... <laughs> somebody's a BDSM and they're in therapy and their therapist kink shames them, i.e. expresses concern over it, they'll be like, I'll just find a kink-friendly therapist. When it's like, sometimes the self-harm is the BDSM. Right, exactly. So I think, once again, when you're talking about the element of just having the element of choice, and you're not talking about the mind-body connection of sex, and how a lot of times women through trauma or through social coercion or otherwise will have experiences of sex that are actually harmful for them, even while we're calling it empowering. It's just like how people in the BDSM world can never tell you why like 99% of subs are female and 99% of doms are male. They'll always throw in the whole, well, female doms exist. I'm just like, well, yeah, like no one's denying that. But the gender split is massively in favor of the women being the subs and the men being the doms, which tracks general gender stereotypes and gender dynamics in the wider world. Yeah. And understanding your sexuality sometimes is a function of your self-esteem. <laughs> I mean, I mean, truthfully, like sometimes when you don't have a good relationship with your body, you'll seek out sexual experiences that reinforce that kind of thing. And I feel like it's important for us to talk about that from an education standpoint. So if our first point was about just the physical biological components, this would be the psychological components, which a lot of times is biological as well, but also like socially enforced. So understanding those narratives, creating a mind body connection and for women to understand when they're seeking out sex or having sex or having sex is not making them feel good or like articulating things that aren't making them feel good because there's actually a connection to how bad they feel about themselves and their body. So the idea is to raise women's self-esteem so that the sexual pleasure that you're having is not a function of you just not having the self-esteem to ask otherwise or feeling you deserve crap, you know? Yeah. And another thing in general, more broadly, is that a lot of people struggle to articulate the why when they do something, right? So I've worked in recruitment a lot of the times and lots of candidates fall down. They have the experience, but they can't articulate or they forget to articulate the reason why they've done something, which is where the higher marks come in because it tracks the applicant's thought process, right? It's the same with sex. People think it's a bad idea to ask themselves why they're doing something, right? They just think, I enjoy it, therefore I enjoy it, and I'm just going to move on. But really, really ask yourself, you know, what is it you're getting out of your sexual encounters? Why do you have sex in a certain way? You can either understand yourself better and then, you know, when you have a better understanding of yourself and your wants and your needs, it's easier to go for that. Or you might actually find, well, hang on a minute, I don't know why I'm doing this or the reason why is rooted in some sort of trauma and you can act accordingly. But asking yourself why is not doubting yourself necessarily or it's not anti-sex or whatever. It's just getting a better understanding of yourself and your thought process because once you have that, it's then a lot easier to advocate for yourself because you'll know what you need to have good sex. Exactly. This episode of The Female Dating Strategy has been brought to you by Manscaped. And it might be the most FDS-aligned advertiser of all time. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and read this whole ad copy from 
top to bottom because scrotes let us learn you how to be attractive to your woman this valentine's day season breaking news ladies manscaped are now selling beard products that's right the, that's right, the leaders in grooming are revolutionizing the men's hygiene game once again with the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. The cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel with 20 hair cutting lengths, all with one guard. So no more messy drawers full of extra add ons. You hear that, ladies? No more messy drawers. Unless he has skid marks, and then we can't help you. You're on your own with that. <laughs> Plus, he can sculpt his look however his heart desires to fully unlock his bearded confidence this Valentine's. Even better, you can save 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com and using the code FDS. Damn, I just really, really love a guy with a good beard along with good hygiene. I mean, this is our 100th episode, is it not? We're 100 episodes in. For 100 episodes, we have begged you to trim your beard and pubes. For all our male listeners, this Valentine's Day, surprise your woman with very neatly trimmed beards by going to manscaped.com getting free shipping and 20% off by entering the code FDS. And if you're a woman and you want to give your man some explicit hints about what he needs to do that'll make him feel good, make him look moisturized. And let's face it, it's also kind of a gift to yourself because you're helping him look more attractive to you. Then go to manscaped.com. Enter code FDS for 20% off and free shipping. The Beard Hedger Pro Kit is the ultimate Valentine's Day present to give his cupid and arrow from manscaped this v-day seven million men trust manscaped with their balls and it's time to trust the hair up top with them too and along with having only one guard which leaves little mess it's also waterproof which means he can shave in the shower whilst he's washing his ass to avoid all that hair in the sink or on the bathroom floor double tasking <laughs> multitasking yay the titanium coated tea blade is tough on hair but smooth on his face manscaped and valentine's day are the perfect pair and the new beard hedger pro kit doesn't end there so what comes in the beard hedger pro kit so you have a beard shampoo and conditioner it's specifically designed to moisturize reduce ingrown hairs and replace natural oils and promote beard health no one likes a dry scraggly brittle struggle beard Okay, so get that shampoo and conditioner and moisturize your beard every day, every day, every day. And follow up with their beard oil. The Manscaped beard oil relieves dryness both on the beard and on the skin beneath while adding a little shimmer and shine, making him look extra fine. And the kit also comes with a beard balm, a pomade that shapes and styles and moisturizes and tames your beard for a sculpted look. Three free gifts, a brush, a comb, shampoo, conditioner, beard balm, beard oil. What are you waiting for? I'm actually angry you're still listening to this commercial and you have not yet gone on to manscaped.com, entered code FDS to get free shipping and 20% off so you can look attractive for your woman this Valentine's Day. Nobody likes a weird beard. And for women, this is a great gift to get them to get their hygiene together. So women, if you have a man who has a beard and he doesn't know that there's all these products out there to help him get his hygiene together, this is the perfect time to broach this discussion during Valentine's Day under the guise of a gift. Tell him he needs to moisturize that struggly, scruffily, scruggly, smuggly beard. The one that like scratches up your whole face when you go to kiss him, makes your badge feel like it's on fire. When he's eating the box. Head over to manscaped.com today using the code FDS. Beard Hedger. One stroke, one guard, 20 lengths. Manscaped.com. Code FDS. So third bullet point. Are you aware of, educated about, and free to choose sexual partners based on favorable physical traits? So physical attraction triggers. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of women, and I've seen this over and over in the forum, where women are like, I thought I was asexual. A lot of women legit, I think I went through an ace <laughs> phase yeah, where same, I thought I was same. asexual too, because I just, but it was really that I thought a lot of the men around me were ugly and unattractive. Like I just was not attracted to them. It does not mean I was asexual. And a lot of that comes down to women blaming themselves when they don't encounter men that they find sexually attractive because men in a lot of ways are not socialized to do things that women find sexually attractive. So I think this is actually huge like a lot of women their sexuality is so shaped by men because a lot of our first introduction to what sex is comes from porn 
that they don't have the ability to connect with themselves enough to realize like, what types of things am I actually attracted to? Like think through it, like legitimately think through and think about when you look at a man, what turns you on about him? Yeah, it's like almost the reverse in that episode when you said like people should move to different locations as well. (laughs) I'm taking that advice in terms of men. Literally, I thought I was like asexual until I go on holiday to Europe and actually every other man is like, like wood, wood, wood shag, wood shag, wood shag. (laughs) But in Britain, my radar doesn't go off ever. Like maybe once every (laughs) five years. (laughs) So I'm literally like, honestly, like I'm not saying other women should do this, but (laughs) I'm trying to get out of England for that reason. (laughs) So I can see more men I'm attracted to (laughs) generally. Dead ass. And it's just nice. And even if you're partnered, like, uh, it's just nice to have, like, men that you find visually appealing just to look at, you know? I think that keeps your sexuality in check. (laughs) They say that there's plenty of fish in the sea. Sometimes that sea's full of dead, rotting anglerfish. Honest to God, like, location does make a massive, well, at least in my experience, location makes a massive, massive difference in terms of, like, sexually attractive men or, like, visually sexually attractive men. Yeah, fish in different waters. Like you don't have to keep putting your <laughs> dipping your toe and pulling out in the dirty Thames. Go to the Atlantic <laughs> in the dirty Thames, pulling out like ugly ass blob fishes and stuff. I think that's actually a huge under uh, study part of women's sexual attraction mechanisms is that a lot of the men around us don't do enough to actually be sexually attractive to us. And so it's not that you're asexual; it's that the men around you just aren't attractive. The ability for women to recognize that and then start to articulate why a man is not sexually attracted to us is so important. So I'm actually huge on body shape. I have a whole diagram. (laughs) Your body shape. Your body shape. Because I would look at men's bodies and I would be like, I'm not attracted to his body. And I don't know why, especially if they're fit. Sometimes I would be like, well, he's fit. I should be attracted to him. But men have body shapes too, like women. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, they have body shapes like women. And then I realized like, oh, I like a man with broad shoulders and an itty bitty waist, like in a big old dump chunk ass. I like guys with like thick, <laughs> thick glute muscles, but not like a, like a peach, but like a guy that has like, he works out his glutes, like aerodynamic thrusting power. Look at that bonus episode on the Patreon. <laughs> like flat bums on men just piss me off. I've spoken about this in the discord, but it just pisses me off, especially when like men don't really have to do a lot to have a decent bum. Like they can literally play basketball or, you know, ride a bike every so often to grow their glutes. But when it's like totally flat, it just annoys me and it's not attractive. Yeah, I want a man who's shaped like a Dorito, like broad shoulders, itty bitty waist. Upside down Dorito, I was thinking. (laughs) Upside down Dorito. Yeah, like the inverted triangle or the trapezoid. I like the trapezoid as well. And some guys are square. But if you look at like men it, like, who are really into fashion, like some like male celebrities, like I know, for example, Kings used to do this a lot. They would have the, like a paule, as they call them, like the shoulder pads for that reason, to give the illusion of broad shoulders. Like men can also, I guess, in the sense that in sort of the way that women can almost manipulate their features to appear like they have a smaller waist, like men can do the same thing. They just can't be bothered. And it's like, this isn't new information. Like the reason why, for example, military dress is the way it is, is to accentuate things like the shoulders and to give the illusion of a narrow waist. Like men in the 1800s got the memo. (laughs) Like literally, honestly, these men, they would wear corsets as well to make their shoulders appear broader and their waist narrower. They would literally wear corsets, super tight corsets. Yeah, men say have given up. (laughs) I'm not doing any of that shit. Yeah, I do remember like those old timey uh, muscle bodybuilding guys and they'd always stick out their chest. But in comparison today where they can get really, really lean, those guys look all flabby and sick. The guys with the handlebar mustaches <laughs> <laughs> and like the slick down middle part. Like, like uh, they, had the right, they had drip. Yeah. Good day, sir. Might I say your muscles are quite dashing today. <laughs> they had drip. For me, it's like the voice. I think like, Honestly, a guy could literally look like Lurtz out of Lord of the Rings. Like, Google it, ladies. Uh, but if he has, like, a smooth voice, it's a wrap for me. Smell is so huge. Like, for me, it's smell. Smell turns me on. There's times where if you're on an elevator or some guy that just walks past you that smells good, it always makes me do a double take. So I feel like if you're a woman and you're trying to figure out, if you think you're asexual, actually, like, watch a bunch of different sports and look at the men's bodies 
<laughs> I'm serious. And try to figure out which group of men's bodies you like. Because I feel like if you watch enough sports, you'll start to figure out like... You'll start to get an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Which body type is for you? Like uh, basketball players are built one way. NBA players are built one way. Baseball players are built one way. Cyclists are built another way. Cross country runners, footballers. They have like different sizes and shapes as well as different types of conditioning. So their muscles grow in different places. So when I think of like men who I'm generally like viscerally sexually attracted to, as far as their body type, it's almost always NFL or baseball players, especially baseball players because I like thicky men, but because <laughs> I like men who are a little thick. But for other women, I know it might be like that tall, slender look of like a diver, right? Yeah, like a swimming body. Yeah. Or as I always suggest, go to a different, if you can afford it. I don't. I, I mean, I always recommend travel generally, but I understand it's not accessible for many people. But also go to different places and locations just to see different, experience different cultures as well, if you can. I find travel is also a good way to reignite your <laughs> sexual drive, especially if you're living in an area where there is like a drought of good looking men. Sometimes just hopping over a border can help to remind you that you are heterosexual. <laughs> yeah, I feel like gay men have this figured out because they have uh, different types of men's bodies, like bears jocks, twinks, fairies, right? And that is a description of different types of bodies that men can have that are attractive to other men. So I feel like it goes to say that for women, we also have sexual preferences as far as like men's physical body types. We haven't really categorized it and we haven't really like cataloged it in a real way, right? So I feel like that's once again, part of what should be part of feminist sex, which is like understanding and cataloging uh, men's body types and understanding how and what turns us on about it, about the different body types. So the physical body type aspect, but also things like Savannah said, their voice, their smell, obviously their penis size, their height, hair, body hair. There's all sorts of things that can turn a woman on. And every obviously every woman's is different, but I don't feel like there's any discussion in our culture of like really actually putting a name to different body types that men have. Because I think if we do that, then women will stop talking about how they're demisexual or asexual and shit and start like start paying attention to like the actual physicality of men. But I think that once again, it's on purpose. Men would feel bad about themselves if women actually talked about men's bodies the way men talk about our bodies, right? And so they are always going to fight against us recognizing and cataloging that men have different body types and that women have different body type preferences, not just penis size, which we do talk about, but just actual physical body type. Because like then if they don't meet that standard, because, you know, women's body types go through seasons of being like popular. So like right now, the hourglass look is really in. But like, what if, you know, the bodybuilder type for men becomes really big, we're like the big, uh, huge muscles, then a bunch of guys who don't have that body type are going to start to feel bad. And that's why they don't want women to have like collective consciousness about what we find sexually attractive, because then they would have to comply and they don't want to comply. So feminist sex needs to focus on cataloging men's bodies, telling women to focus on and, and uh, know that it's okay to have physical preferences and to recognize when, if you're actually asexual or if you just think dudes are ugly, you just think the men around you are sexually unattractive because those are two different things. <laughs> it's just annoying though, like a lot of the lib fem media and liberal feminists, I mean, more so liberal feminists mean well when they say that we shouldn't body shame men, but it's like, it's not the same <laughs> yeah, we should. and it's not the same and it could even be a woman saying like i don't find x guy attractive or i think x guy is ugly like i'll say we should body shame men i'm just like stop <laughs> like it's not body shaming to not be attracted to something or to a feature or a certain feature and again like rose said it's just not the same i think it has different connotations when women say something like that versus when men say something like that but voice your preferences. Be loud and proud about your preferences, ladies, because men are doing exactly the same thing, is what I'd say. Yeah. And recognize that you have preferences. You don't have to be attracted to a guy just because he's nice to you and he's not like ugly, right? Because sometimes I think women feel bad because they look at a guy and he's like, well, he's not ugly, but they don't feel viscerally sexually attracted to him. But there's a such a massive difference between a guy that you like, but you're not viscerally sexually attracted to and a man you are viscerally sexually attracted to. <laughs> It's totally different. And also, as I always say, I might get this printed on a t-shirt, but pussy is not socialist. It's not open. It's not like everyone who can't get it needs access. No. Exactly. So 
Which brings us to our next point, which I think we don't want to just focus on things we find attractive about men that are physical, but also behavioral. And where this comes into play in our culture and in women's sexuality is in the form of erotica, because erotica relies very heavily on certain behaviors and sexually attractive behaviors that men can exhibit that women like. Yeah. And you can see the difference between erotica and porn. So erotica is mainly geared towards women in that there is like, besides, cause I read a lot of erotica, as you all know, and a lot of women say like, oh, this erotica is an FDS aligned. And I personally don't think that's necessarily the point. But what I found consistent across all the erotica that I've read from, you know, period romance to BDSM erotica is that the woman's wider needs are being met. So the guy is handsome. The guy has money, usually. The guy's affectionate. The guy cares about her. The guy cares about her sexual pleasure, you know, versus porn where, you know, we just see there's no storyline, there's no plot. And that is very deliberate because it's marketed towards men who are then conditioned into not caring about the other aspects of romance that are present in erotica novels usually. And so that's a massive difference like between the two. I'll probably do a special episode on my favourite eroticas, but even though they still pick me, a lot of them, in fact, all of them, but they do hit the mark on the woman's wider needs being met. So, for example, one of my favourite eroticas of all time is a BDSM one, and in it she meets a dom and they begin a relationship and he made sure all of her financial needs were taken care of. He was always available to her. He was always interested in her as a person. And even though it had that overarching BDSM storyline, but the point was that, I mean, you could understand, you know, why there was a deeper sexual connection because she felt taken care of by this man. Yeah, I think erotica is a good place to start when we talk about what women's sexuality would look like if it was somewhat free of male coercion. And if men showed up and actually fully did their part as well. Yeah, because it's really, really comprehensive in comparison to gonzo porn, right? Like, just like Savannah said, gonzo porn, there's no plot. It's just a woman and a man or a woman or multiple men, multiple people have sex in a very out of context way. That's not necessarily how women's sexuality works. That seems to be primarily how men's sexuality works. And so I feel like it's really important to recognize that women's sexuality has a much more comprehensive set of factors that we need to feel sexual attraction. And I feel like we need to fight for that and push that forward as just as equally valid and as a sexuality as what our porn culture has turned us into. So a couple of points to back up what Savannah's saying about erotic novels. I never really read BDSM, but like I did go through like my trashy romance novel phase, like everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, a couple of the tropes that I liked of the books that I read, and you see this over and over, the guy's always handsome, right? He's always tall and handsome. So I feel like universally, at least I've never read an erotica that was about a man who was shorter than the woman. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen it. Or a guy who was admittedly unattractive. Like, they always go to great detail about how, you know, he's got washboard abs or he's tall or he's got a clean cut jaw, or full head of hair, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So women's sexual attraction universally seems to be tied to height. So sorry. Doesn't mean that like it's a, women won't find shorter men attractive. I just think it's not as common. I think most commonly women are sexually attracted to men who are it doesn't have to be super tall, but at least taller than them. I mean, ultimately, like erotica is based on the author's on the author's pick, and they're aware of this too. Also, bearing in mind that a lot of erotic novels are actually written by men, but they're released under a female name. Interesting. I think all the people that I read were actually women because they had like photos and uh, would do book tours and stuff. But oh, okay. So another thing that you'll see in a romance novel is there's usually some kind of journey and the entire journey is part of the sexual awakening itself. So this is why, once again, it's such a contrast to Gonzo porn. And I think this is why men don't understand our sexuality because they want it to be like, if I plug in X and Y factors, it should spit out Z. But it's actually the journey of discovering the sexuality with another person is part of our sexual turn-ons. And men always want to skip past that part. And, and I'm not even talking about just foreplay. I'm talking about the getting to know that person. And it's part of the intimacy as well. Like in, you know, recognizing that there will be sometimes barriers that need to be overcome. There'll be shyness, there'll be nerves, but it's also navigating through that together. And 
the man in this instance, in a lot of the articles I read, he was always very supportive or had some further insight or scaled back. Do you know what I mean? And it's just stuff that doesn't really play out in things like porn or even heterosexual relationships more generally when they want sex by the third day before they even know when your birthday is. Yeah, that's why we always say pushing off sex is better. And it's not just because of us trying to put an arbitrary date in place to test men or whatever, but even though it is a good test, but it's also because like you need time to build sexual intimacy. I just think that a lot of women's sexuality is slower, right? Meaning the entire process of discovering that person as a sexual being is what builds sexual attraction and builds sexual tension for women. And men don't understand that, which is why they're always trying to rush it. But I think, again, this might be a place where women's sexuality and men's sexuality is is somewhat at odds. I'm not saying it's always like this because there's some guys who are just like hot as fuck and I get like it's a struggle to not want to fuck them. But like sometimes a lot of our sexuality does need a little bit more of a time to grow, right? The other thing uh, that you'll see in romance novels is the man makes some kind of sacrifice or act of fealty or does an amazing feat, an amazing feat. And I really feel like this is an understudied part of female sexual attraction as well, is that male competition, male sacrifice is actually sexy to women. And it's actually not just us. It's like sexy to female mammals. Because when you look at the sexuality of a lot of other female mammals, this is why, you know, male moose will grow big antlers and fight each other. You know, male hippos are really like aggressive towards each other during mating season. A lot of that is because both for sexual dominance against the other man, but also like sexual display for the female. So I feel like when we talk about why certain men are sexually attractive to women and not others, a lot of it comes down to like their ability to do things that make them look like they're going to be good protective partners for your offspring, right? On a very primal level. So this is why athletes pretty much get whatever they want, right? I mean, seriously, they're like, they're super paid. They have all the money in the world. And also they're the best physical offerings of our species, the best physical examples of our species. So essentially it's because on a very primal level, we recognize, at least for the thousands of years that humans were developing, that a man who has physical prowess is able to navigate the world a lot easier as well as like, it's just sexy to us to watch a man do shit, right? This is why a lot of women also like men who work in blue collar professions, right? They like a man who works with his hands. They like a man who like has those type of jobs because sometimes watching men do these type of physical feats, especially because like they're stronger than us is actually sexual. Like it's sexy to watch a man chop wood, right? It's sexy to watch a man mow lawns or, you know, and it can be sexy to watch a man like pick up a baby, right? It's just about men doing these both uh, pro pro social, useful things, physical things, using their body for good. I feel like that's also part of women's sexuality that's not talked about because there's not really like, I think we're kind of talking about it because like now with, especially on TikTok, you're starting to see guys like get a lot of attention on their TikTok for doing things like chopping wood with their shirts off, you know, like uh, cooking meat in like a sexy way, (laughs) like chopping up meat. I feel like we're just on the precipice of recognizing this because of things like TikTok where if you're a man and you're reasonably attractive and you're also doing like some kind of physical activity, you'll get a ton of followers from girls on TikTok. And I feel like that's a very primal sexual thing for women is hot men doing useful things is a whole sexual trope. Like if I were design porn for women, that would be the first thing. It'd be hot men doing useful shit. <laughs> hot men doing useful shit to, for society. <laughs> The other part of women's sexuality, when a man makes you feel unique and special. So that's also a trope that's always in the romance novel. So there's always a guy and a lot of it glorifies toxic relationships, unfortunately, but there's always some kind of problem for them to solve for which why the man can't fully be there for her. Right. And a lot of it has to do with like, he's emotionally unavailable that he learns to love because of her, right? Like the whole beauty and the beast trope. But the sexual trigger behind that is that he opens up for the right woman, that she's special to him in some type of way. And because she's special to him, that changes to him. 
that's a problematic theme for a lot of reasons, but it does help to explain why so many women are attracted to toxic men or end up in relationships with toxic men because of the eroticization of a man treating you like you're special, right? Because women want to be treated like we're special. You don't necessarily want to feel like you're just another person. So if you can get a guy to be vulnerable with you in a way that he's not with other people, that makes women feel special. And then that can be a sexual attraction trigger. The key to that is having it be with a man who's high value and not a completely abusive screw. And I feel like there's a marked difference between a man who is more reserved with women until he gets to know them and a man who's a psychopath who tries to control you through emotional uh, withholding and abuse, right? Totally different. But I feel like in romance novels, that line isn't always drawn clearly and in our culture that isn't always drawn clearly. And so you have a lot of women that end up being turned on and sexually coerced by these like emotion abusive men because they think it's going to, you know, they have low self-esteem. So they feel like this thing, if I just prove to him I'm different, then he's going to treat me like I'm special. But the truth of the matter is you have to treat yourself like you're special. And then the man who will treat you like you're special will come along. And I feel like that's just as good than doing things to try to prove yourself that you're special. So I guess it depends on the romance novels too, because there's some where the man like thinks the girl is special right away, but there's some reason why she's reluctant. So you'll see both because it's a book. It has to have some kind of conflict, but again, it's a fairy tale. Yeah. With romance novels, I think like more broadly, women can take a lot from them positives, but we also have to sometimes like leave the underlying storyline because even that storyline is often problematic because it ends up the man ends up wearing the woman down into dating him which isn't ideal either but yeah you know so i just think just take the good bits like the sex scenes and the intimacy and the sexual build-up and just leave the rest is what i do and oftentimes a conflict is you know one of them doesn't want to commit basically yeah or they can't commit because my family will disown me if i marry a simple stable boy you know (laughs) (laughs) stuff like that (laughs) So that's some of the key takeaways we can glean from romance novels, from erotica novels about women's sexuality. So I think that's a good place to start when we're talking about like, what are women's sexual attraction triggers when it comes to social interactions with men? Is that erotica really provides us with a framework that seems to be pretty consistent about the types of behaviors that men can exhibit that turn us on in addition to just being tall, dark, and handsome. (laughs) Yeah. So that's the first part of our feminist sex series. Let us know what you think. You can discuss this on our website on thefemaledatingstrategy.com. Also on our Discord from the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash thefemaledatingstrategy. You can also follow us on Twitter at femdatstrat and also on Instagram at underscore thefemaledatingstrategy. Thanks for listening, queens. And for all you scrotes out there, All the women around you are not asexual. You're just ugly. Die bad. (laughs) See you next week, ladies. Bye.